So I'm here to tell you a few stories about tough times, what it means to survive, find resilience, and a bit why Ed and C believe we must be brave. 2017 was a tough year for many of our friends and neighbors and colleagues. It was a tough year for me, and maybe even a tough year for you. Our job with education in North Carolina provide us with the incredible privilege of crisscrossing a state in an effort to elevate the voice, identify bright spots, and ask hard questions. Yet the biggest privilege of them all is the opportunity to lead remarkable people doing incredible work in communities large and small. Part of that privilege is understanding that no matter our hardship, that we're not alone. Others have traveled the journey. Others are perhaps traveling it still, and that's an important lesson for us all. I was born in Morgan at Grace Hospital. Found out last night when Google Maps has now changed its name as Hospital Consolidations Continue. But it was called Grace then. Uh, my parents were teenagers, children really, uh, yet they were addicted to drugs and alcohol. Each of them had remarkable talent and ability, but they struggled. They loved us, my sister and I, but love wasn't quite enough to leave them out of the challenges that they faced. By the age of three, my parents were not living together any longer. This story in an era of opioid deaths and a surge in foster care isn't an isolated one for many North Carolinians. By the time it felt unique to the little boy that had to cover his ears to avoid the fighting and screaming in the next room for the first three years of my life. By the age of four, I wouldn't be living with either of my parents until my nana showed up. I didn't really want to mess with her. <laughs> she brought my sister and I out of her mother's home after stopping by one morning and finding us alone. She didn't really do it the traditional way. I don't think she called the Department of Social Services, but it was pretty well said that she was going to take us. Um, it wasn't just her, it was my grandmother, my Anna Joy, my aunt, my uncle, my cousins who rescued me. They gave me a home, they gave me stability. Um, really a series of homes, truthfully. It wasn't always stable, given that it bounced around frequently until fifth grade, but the one consistency was love. I told this story recently, and I realized I hadn't thought of it in years, that when I would drive back and forth between the house, I would always tell my, my uh, parents, my aunt, my uncle, um, that the moon was my friend. I don't know who came up with this concept, it was one of them. Um, and one day my aunt said, well, where does the moon go when you're at school? And I said, well, the moon knows I'm safe, so I think they go play with the baby kangaroos. <laughs> now, I think that's a really wonderful idea for a children's book, so I want to copyright that. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend this kind of upheaval for any child. But I did learn a lot about the power of love and hope and resilience during this time period. I learned that the one constant beyond the love of my family was often the schoolhouse and the local library. It's a vital lesson that I believe holds true for our communities even now. We can't cure addiction. We can't necessarily make families whole. A ready-made policy solution exists to create stable home lives. But we can begin to understand the schools and libraries and even places of faith can offer stability and hope for children like me. It was that hope that led me to UNC Chapel Hill, no offense to this great institution. <laughs> UNC opened my eyes and my mind, it opened up opportunities to work on literacy. I met friends who remain some of the most important people in my life. We won a national title my freshman year, and I experienced what it's like for everyone to be your friend in one town in one night. <laughs> Felt like home. Another student with Brett Dietrich made her way to Chapel Hill two years prior to that. Our paths likely crossed in the quad. Probably bumped into each other before as the leaves fell in October, passing some of the lights. We actually um, first met when she was introducing a public speaker, and I'll find out later I was on the same row as her mother, who had driven up from South Carolina. Her name was Jamie, and she developed a love for public policy as she grew up. At UNC, my professors inspired me, my fellow students inspired me even more, and one day I found my way to a political campaign. She emailed the political science department at UNC and called for volunteers, and she didn't really know what she was getting into. So I kept emailing and emailing and emailing and emailing, and if you know me, you know that that's still true today. Um, finally, an opportunity to exist emerged, and I walked into the little office that was at campaign's headquarters, and I was at Glenn and Jamie's desk. I can still recall her welcoming smile, her freckles, her laugh. Her laugh would fill a room, and I didn't know it would become an important soundtrack. Uh, part of the soundtrack of my life in years to come. She and I became best friends. Who wouldn't? Between her infectious spirit, 
humility, caring nature, and laugh, which would lead to love. In time, I met love moved beyond friendship. I couldn't imagine my life without her. As the campaign began to wind down, Jamie transferred to another campaign, slowly opened her eyes and mind and heart to the idea that maybe that little kid that was her intern originally might be something more. Eventually, one crisp February night, we kissed. We moved pretty quickly from there. Our life was wonderfully normal. We moved to Charleston, became engaged, moved back to North Carolina's our home. We married, moved into an apartment, adopted two cats, because anytime she was feeling the least bit down, we'd be like, oh, let's go to the pet store, let's go to the SBCA, always come home with an animal. Um, Jamie became an entrepreneur, formerly, firmly focused on female uh, empowerment and public policy. And I began my career with an emphasis around community engagement. Tom, we adopted another dog, as you, some of you may know, Tom Henderson, I think to this day that he completely planted this. So we ended up at his farm, and he was like, well, this rock just will not feed. Like, you have to hold it in your arms to make it, to make it eat. <laughs> so I put it in Jamie's arms, and about 30 minutes later, he's like, oh, and by the way, if you want to adopt it, you absolutely can. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, I was kind of stuck. Um, we had begun to talk about having kids as we moved into a two-story home, because it seemed like the logical next step, because we knew she would make the best mother. Some of us have experienced with so-called normal lives being shattered. Perhaps you can recall standing at the kitchen counter, chopping up an onion as part of dinner, perhaps with music on the background and the phone rang. Perhaps you were watching television one day when someone representing the military knocks on the door. Or perhaps you were opening the door to rush up to work and you're stopped in your tracks and decide the police start pulling the driveway and tell you that your child won't come home anymore. The phone ringing, the door knocking, the scream that breaks the silence. These moments often divide life into before and after. On Monday, April 22nd, 21st, 2013, Jamie and I were brutally attacked. She died and I survived. If you're a survivor, if your beloved wife or child or parent dies, then perhaps the most surprising thing the days to come the sun still shines, the world still spins, and people are living out their lives as if the very foundations of the world were not shattered. As noted writer Roxane Gay once said, surviving something doesn't make you strong, it makes you a survivor. Surviving the traumatic loss is far from easy. It's something I hope no one in this room has to face, although I fear that'll be the case for too many of you. The last statistic I heard said that roughly 3 million Americans die every year, which means millions of parents, brothers, sisters, parent partners, and friends are left behind. Survival doesn't make you strong, but it can lend you strength as you realize that you can face the first day back to work, make it through the first anniversary, the first holidays, or the five year marks at Southern Loss, which is coming up for me this spring. Truthfully, resilience is a skill we don't have until we're faced with a situation where we have to show it. Some define it as a capacity to recover. One definition says to recover quickly, but I prefer to consider resilience the ability to be knocked down and eventually get back up, even if you require the help of so many others to do so. My friend Elizabeth Edwards once wrote, if I had special knowledge about how to avoid adversities, how to spot the pitfalls of life, I would spot them. I would avoid them. I would share how it is I managed to do that. I have not. I do have a lot of experience, however, in getting up after being knocked down. That's as good a definition of any for resilience that I've found. But why does it matter so deeply? It matters because too many of our children are going hungry. It matters because in the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew, we were down in National County had students who told us that even still, when rain fell, even if it was small, even if it was minor, they were worried that the floods were going to come and wash away their homes. It matters in Madison County, this is where we went this summer, and where we met too many young women who were living with their nanas um, and their grandfathers and their cousins because their parents had simply disappeared. <coughs> That's not a picture from my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Your place. Still love pullovers. 
Um, <laughs> the truth is, we can't protect our children from adversity. Try as we might. You know, the hardest thing in the aftermath of loss from my parents, I was in missing Jamie, was to try to fix me. Right? Um, the truth is, our children will lose someone they can't live without. They might face illness, or help a parent or a friend face illness. They might bury their best friend. We would all be happier if we could protect those we love from such experiences, but we're not going to be able to. We're going to face trauma, and that's why the work of so many in this field matters. I was just speaking to someone right beforehand who was talking about a trauma sensitive uh, conference they're going to hold this year. Um, is that work alongside so many other initiatives that could be helping? Building trauma sensitive environments requires us to begin to engage in conversation to listen. Uh, to combat, as Leslie sort of put it, an epidemic of loneliness in our state, in our country, in our world. It's work for all of us who lead or aspire to lead. It's work that we might all learn from. So I want to tell you a few lessons in leadership I've seen across the state. Uh, we visited Edgecombe County often. How many people have been there recently? It's a county full of innovative leaders who are actively engaging their community in conversation about the future of Prince Elementary School, which closed in the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew. They're tackling trauma-sensitive learning racial equity within the school system. My friend Seth Steeling and his colleague Bishi are applying design thinking and aiming it towards system change. We get emotional when we visit still closed Prince Elementary School and see the impact of Hurricane Matthew a year plus later. A young man named Elijah was the first student I ever met in Michigan County. He's involved in the Beta Club, preaches at his church, mentors other students, and generally puts my accomplishments to shame as, as a seventh grader. When we asked him what he did after Matthew hit and the waters rose and he and his family found shelter, he answered simply that he went to a nearby shelter to help. When we asked him why, he said he didn't know what else to do. We can all learn from that thing. We also found hope in the mountains, closer to where I'm from. I'll never forget the young lady in Madison County I met in August. Who, had, who was living without her incarcerated father and her mother had disappeared because, well, she was probably on some stuff, as the student's grandmother told me, if you had a small church. And yet even that conversation gave us hope. In Madison County, Paige serves as a lifeline, a launching pad for the young woman we met and others just like her. Paige hires residents from the community and invests in young women who will lead the way forward for Madison County and perhaps the whole region. The young lady we met aspired to be a photographer. My guess is she'll be successful. Just before Christmas, we found ourselves at Nash Community College. We toured Nash as part of a series of community college visits across the state, which allows us to meet the people who are doing the hard work of building the workforce that meet tomorrow's opportunities at home. We were able to visit the electrical lines in the program. Yay, power on seeing you smiling. We saw their work around economic development in Rocky Mountain Mills. We heard about their partnership with Single Stop. And all that's important, uh, but one of the things that really struck us as we walked out in the hallway uh, was a class full of nurses who had come from Puerto Rico. And NASH had expanded their program to meet the opportunity and the challenge of preparing these Puerto Rican nurses to serve their newfound communities here in North Carolina. I think that's a quintessential North Carolina story. It's one that gives me hope. Probably didn't get many headlines, but it's one that speaks to what Archie Davis called the generosity of spirit in the state. We've seen countless other North Carolina communities, despite the challenges in front of them, open up their doors to people facing hardship. These stories matter, and stories in general matter. At Education NC, we believe we're in the business of storytelling. In part, because stories frame and explain our world. They make sense of the senseless and offer us lessons on how to love, live, lead, and even grieve. As Leslie alluded to earlier, we faced a loss of trust in institutions for decades now. And it's my belief that much of that decline in trust flows from a lack of listening, a lack of belief that those in power care, and a crippling lack of empathy. All this combines up to create a world where an awful lot of us are lonely, painfully so. And yet I've found faith in our future as I see programs across our state who are truly listening. Perhaps there's uh, spots of life that Leslie alludes to are, are everywhere. And I've found plenty of reasons to believe that our future will be brighter than our present and our children. 
They have a near limitless capacity to believe and dream and create. They're not bound by the same preconceived notions and beliefs that have been instilled in us over time. In truth, a lot of us just need to get out of the way. When Brian spoke to me of leading, speaking to leading in times of disruption, it's my hope that we'll see disruption as an opportunity to create positive change, not something to be afraid of. After all, it's up to us to build solutions and opportunities and lead in a way today that will allow our students to dream big and continue to disrupt the status quo. Thank you. where there are children present. Because I think in, in not sharing those stories, we're not showing that it can happen. Yeah. You can make it, and you can succeed. So I appreciate you doing that. Okay, I'm going to Graham. Yeah. yeah, the truth is our culture is really, really terrible at talking about grief um, and trauma. And we just always have them. And, uh, you know, I think one of the more stunning things after Jamie died was how few people wanted to really talk about it, right? And I think to this day, like as you think, Leslie, uh, of the epidemic of loneliness, one of the things I see with my mother-in-law, for example, is how many friends in her bridge club and others don't bring up loss because they're afraid it'll make her sad. And then my friend Kathy Higgins had come back from Australia 12 years ago, really jazzed about a group called Parent Voice that sort of did the same in the public health sphere. Um, and all of those ideas have sort of come together and, and consolidated. Mona and I traveled to stay last summer and fall. It felt like something was happening that wasn't really being picked up. Um, and so we started asking, like, how do you connect to people who aren't really heard? How do you have a conversation? How do you connect them? Um, and so we created this sort of platform, Regency Voices, which you might know a lot about on our website. But it's a combination of messaging applications, Facebook Messenger, and online surveys, and in-person surveys, all sort of built around this theme of how do we create a participatory design process for the state? Um, how do we truly connect people to those in power and those in power to people? in ways that will generate better understanding, uh, more opportunities to learn from one another, and even try to generate some solutions from the top, from the bottom up, as opposed to just the top down. Um, generally, we found that if you ask folks in the community for solutions, they actually know what they need. Uh, and I think sometimes we're probably really good at that. Is that good? <laughs> Thank you for letting me tell them what we're doing. When you think about the disruptions, especially for children in our education system across North Carolina, both urban and rural, what are some of the focus, when, when you are here in this group of leaders, what should we focus on when we think about the systems issue? Because we focus a lot on what are the deficiencies of the child. But there are some pieces around public policy and systems that I think as the leaders in this room, we can do a better job in raising awareness and focusing on and changing how we do business with some of the new disruptions that are happening. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think for one thing, we need an early childhood system. Um, I don't think that we truly have a system as you, as you might conceive of it the rest of the sort of K-12 sector. Um, everyone talks about the high expense of child care, through the child care centers, as you know, and generally lose money on kids zero to two, they might break even on kids for age three, and then if they're lucky and they have kids left or age four, they might be profitable. And so that's a huge challenge in rural communities, as you know, and I think we've got to think about that. Um, I think trauma-sensitive environments, trauma-sensitive learning matters. Um, if you ask any number of experts, they're going to tell you the one silver bullet to sort of fixing education, if we and not that it needs to be fixed, the one silver bullet um, for education would be a sort of tackling ACEs head on. Adverse experiences. Understanding that our kids bring more 
um, with them than just the book bags in the classroom. And I think there's some pretty uh, remarkable examples around the state of that. I mean, Buncombe County is doing, I think, just a tremendous job. Um, David Thompson, student services director there, has built this broad based coalition. Um, and Edgecombe County, Seth Seeling, and Vichy are working with the district to put together a design thinking sort of process um, that will tackle that. I mean, we were down there in the summer school. And, they were literally contemplating creating a sexual assault survivor's group in middle school. Like, if that doesn't blow you back and stagger you and make you sort of even begin to conceive of the diversity of actual children in the schools and how much more they're carrying with them, then I don't know what will, right? So I think that is a huge, huge issue we have to tackle that on. And then I think, um, finally, Christy, I appreciate this with your work. I think we have to, when we talk about degree attainment, we have to understand there's a whole spectrum of post-secondary. Um, and I think we have to adapt what we have to be in funding to that, right? Um, the truth is, credentials and stackable credentials in particular can provide a, a lifelong sustainable employment. We don't think about that often enough. Um, I think we have at times become sort of really fixated on four year degree when the truth is, there are so many opportunities for two year degrees and credentials. They are missing, and as you know, and traveling through community colleges is quite excited about that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think if we listen to communities too, we'll discover sort of other policy changes. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I guess a little bit of a commercial and then a question to go along with it. Um, sometimes I think when we have conversations about children and the complexities of what children are facing today, um, if we are not fully ingrained in whether it's the schoolhouse or with a nonprofit organization or, you know, it somewhat seems overwhelming, like what can I do, and we glaze over. Um, I would be curious when you said, you know, certainly the love that you felt and the hope that you felt from family that you were with, but then you also mentioned school and library. What were those things that you found at school and in the library that helped you to have hope and to see what your potential was. And I want to go from that to something that Chad Lloyd and I have talked a lot about related to what we can all do. It helped have teachers and librarians who encouraged us. Um, Dr. Robert Franks at Harvard encouraged us to think about when we, when we think about adversity. Um, to understand that schools and libraries are places of faith and places where kids spend as much of their working hours and so to think as we build community-wide solutions as these places as additional homes in the lives of children. Um, some might, I think, take issue with that frame, but they might think, well, there are and that's the responsibility of parents. Uh, but the truth is, that's not always the case for two kids, right? Um, and so Dr. Franks has laid out, I think, a pretty ambitious idea for how we build these institutions. You know, and we've seen some of this, like Edgecombe County has washers and dryers in the school. Simple, simple innovation. Yeah, it makes a profound difference in getting parents there. It makes a profound difference in kids having to wash their own clothes at home. Um, there was a middle school I was in recently where the resource center was actually student managed. And so the whole idea was that a, for a student could turn to another student and say, you know, I'm hungry. And that student could then just go ask the principal for the to go get the food and bring it to the student to reduce the barrier of having to admit something that perhaps they felt shame. So I mean, there's remarkable innovations like that everywhere. And if you go to a rural library, I mean, every single computer is full, right? And so I mean, I thought the library not too long ago they said they're thinking of themselves more of as guides to how to live, research, or think, um, as opposed to someone who's looking for you. I mean, I think you see these little innovations throughout the state, um, and I think Dr. Francis brought the right to think about it as like a constellation of homes um, that provide stability and opportunity for children, not just like the home. Um, Particularly, I think, as Sophia was referencing, I mean, one of our big questions when we were up in Madison County is, okay, well, if all of the nanas are taking care of this generation, what's the next generation going to look like? Who are, who's going to be there for them? Uh, the one constant, consistent place is likely to be school. Um, and so I think a lot more of our efforts can go to that, looking at something like that. That's just not that way. The title of the talk dealt with disruptive leadership. 
and you chose to come and share a deeply personal story of resilience. Help me build the bridge a little bit between concepts of leadership and disruption, whether it's personal or organizational, and these notions of resilience that you, you know that you kind of been talking about this morning, and how you kind of cognitively built this bridge from a topic to the choice to come share. And thank you very much for this kind of very deep resilient story, if you will. I think truth is I think it's the sum of our life experiences that prepare us to lead. Um, and I think oftentimes we uh, I want to include myself as well as a leader, but we as leaders maybe sand want to sand down our personal story. Um, we want to uh, think really only about where we are and maybe where we're going. Truth is, a lot of the way that we lead. I mean, trauma, for example, is not really let me act, right? It is actually the physiological response to stress. Um, and rarely, you know, until I think the last 10 years, have we stopped to consider that. Um, stop to consider what stress or feeling threatened might mean for our leadership style, right? We know from the research in ACEs that only does have an impact on our, on our health, that has an impact on the way we behave. One of the things we see over and over again with children when they're going through adversity um, is a fight, flight, or freeze mentality. And so one of the things that really smart educators who are focused on ACEs have come to realize is that rather than asking a kid, like, why'd you do that? You ought to ask them, what's going on with you? What's going on at home? Um, and I think that the, the best leaders in this sort of period of disruptive change when maybe all of us are feeling a little more stressed and a little more anxious um, could become more aware of Sort of the personal lives of those around us and those of even that we're in opposition with. Um, and I think that's where building sort of promises of environments, to me, not just in schools, but in the workplace and in our leadership style matters. Um, and that's sort of why I chose to talk on that. In addition to Brian giving me instructions that um, were pretty firm. Uh, <laughs> except I can't really, you know, think about the presentation. <laughs> um, but I do think that we have to pay more attention to toxic stress. We have to pay more attention to a world that feels more stressful for so many of us, regardless of political affiliation, um, in our leadership style. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about that. Um, but also, I hope that people take away from this that there are a lot of tough stories out there. It was a tough year for money, but I mean, like, I've never been more optimistic you know, about this day. Um, true, and this world. I'm sure this has been no better time in human history to be alive. Um, and I think sometimes. Avalanche push notification, we forget that. Bob Edwards, and I hope Ron didn't run me out when we asked him this question. <laughs> I have a two part question, Nation. What I was participating in part of the group here. How many of you grew up in a rural area? I mean, I see a show of hands. Okay, very good. How many of you now still live in a rural area? Okay. This is my question, Nation, because you're talking about disruption. And so folks will understand, North Carolina is a state, not a system of schools, but a state school system. Unfortunately, the disruption of leadership has led to the disruption of funding. And I was intrigued by your comments regarding Edge Palm County and Madison, which I have some understanding. Interested in your thoughts, because as we leave those rural areas and leadership leaves, and we carry our leadership skills to other areas. Who's left to provide that leadership to fight for those children? Because if we aren't fighting for those children, they're the next generation of leadership. You now are that leadership. And if we don't fight to make sure the system is somewhat level, it's going to be awful hard to provide the jobs of the future and the skills we need to build that future. I'd be interested in your thoughts because you talked about those media centers we call a libraries now that aren't funded because of disruption of policies that are made at the state level funding across the system. If you could respond to that. No, I mean, I think, uh, I'm sure that's a, a great point. I mean, one of the things that we've seen, I mean, what's all saying, like, don't show me, tell me what you care about, show me your budget. And I mean, that's a that's an important message. I mean, when you look at Edgewell County, one of the things that Superintendent Farrell did is now who Dom did really well there is he worked hand in hand with the school board and the board of commissioners um, that understood the need to, for example, 
put more money into the teacher pay, you know, in terms of informed supplements. And they understood, um, and he also was willing to take chances. I mean, here's one of the things, right? Like, I actually think that a lot of young folks would be inclined to stay in rural areas if they saw opportunity. Um, and Superintendent Farley was willing to put people who have been in the classroom for two years in as principal. And like for a lot of us, we look at it and we're like, well, that's not the way things go. I'm supposed to meritocracy, you stay there for 25 years, and eventually you get denied it and you move into principal. Um, but Donnell Cannon in North Ashland High School is probably one of the best education leaders in the state. And he spent exactly two or three years. Uh, Lauren Lamprin at Patilla Middle is probably the best principal I've seen in the middle school in the state. I've been seeing principals in middle schools. Um, and I think she was in the classroom for one year and then she went to Neela. You know, and so he was willing to take a chance because one of the things I think that's worth for leaders is if you wake up every day and you look in the mirror and you're not worried about keeping your job, you're worried about doing what's right, then I do think things will follow. And I think that's one of the things that John Farley did really well. I think it's one of the things that Dr. Richards is now doing really well in Ashton. And that investing in youth, I mean, what I've seen is, you know, a lot of people take their shots at TFA, but I've seen a lot of TFA folks who chose to stay in the National work go and then come back because they saw opportunity to build a leadership capacity there. Um, and Seth and Vichy are great examples of that who may not be from there, but they certainly are of there now. Um, and I think if our communities take a, a harder look at how we build those pipelines, it'll matter a lot. Um, and then you know, we have to make sure our budget's solid, but thank you. Thank you all. Please join me in thanking you.